I've had a wonderful week, had a chance to talk, meet with the Academic Council, gave a uh, community workshop in the work that reconnects, and then the wonderful class with Sherry's environmental leadership course, and there uh, two uh, nuclear guardians, uh, Kathleen Sullivan and Christopher Hormel joined me, and we did a lot of work around uh, what the challenges of this time, challenges to life on this planet, challenges so real in terms of climate change, abrupt climate change, uh, contamination from uh, changing the genetic structure of seeds, the whole thing, to the point where, and the mass extinctions, we're not even, can't count on there being uh, enough biodiversity to uh, create a, a foundation for complex life forms. And so this challenges us to really have a romp with our moral imagination and our senses, and because we are given to be alive in this time. And so we want to appreciate it and to be glad to be alive. That's our birthright. And so we use that uh, for looking at the uh, scary and extremely painful things that we have to face. So tonight I am delighted to give my first talk ever on uh, the uh, challenge and teachings of the poison fire. Now, by poison fire, that is a term that uh, after you know, a, few, a few decades ago, as we were beginning to work with it, that term um, emerged as a uh, name for uh, radioactive contamination that as the future ones will be uh, needing to know about it and suffering its effects and uh, they won't know it as um, depleted uranium or uranium-238 or plutonium. They won't know what caused necessarily, what, why we made it, why we abandoned it, what is, how they can protect themselves. But a phrase that will become, uh, comes from them as we did a lot of role plays uh, with the future uh, generations the term, the poison fire. And uh, then the first world uranium hearing that took place 25 years ago, 23 years ago in Salzburg, took that name for it and said this comp assembly on the poison fire future. So that's what we're talking about. And I would like to talk about it in sort of these blocks. One is my adventures on the way with the poison fire. Uh, secondly, the challenge, that's very brief. And then the teachings. So, you ready? <laughs> so the story for me began uh, less than 40 years ago. So that was, I had been out here at Naropa, I'd come to the Summer Institute, I was going back home, and my son Jack was at his freshman year in college in Boston, and he came home at Christmas, and he said, Mom, you might be interested in this paper I wrote. I'm sure I would, I said, and looked, and it was thermal pollution from nuclear reactors and energy production. It was only thermal pollution. He didn't even deal with the radioactive. He was dealing with what, how in the containment vessel, these very, very hot uh, fuel rods, how the whole thing gets hotter and hotter and you have to keep cooling it. And you cool it with water so they have to be near a source of water by a shore or a lake or a river or stream. And, and then the water as it comes out is 20 degrees hotter. And what this does to aquatic life across the country. Jack, I said, are you sure this is true? If this were true, sportsmen would be out en masse and the uh, 
scientists and uh, people would be in the streets. So he said, check it out, Mom. So I did. And then, of course, I found that in addition to the thermal pollution and the, that affects the coastlines and the waters of, was uh, the poisoning of the soil and the air and the water through ionizing radiation. Uh, even in the course of natural emissions, not, without uh, even having an accident at a, a nuclear energy station. So there I was a little while later uh, with Jack and his affinity group, and we were occupying Seabrook. Anybody remember Seabrook Reactor? That was in New Hampshire. Here it was one of the great events, and as um, Rocky Flats had been, with it, which was nationwide, how stirring it was when the uh, local people and people from around the country came and sat on the tracks to block the functioning of it, having learned what it was doing, having found out about the toxicity it was pouring into the whole region. So uh, he turned me into uh, a, a dissenter. I, I was already pretty much of an activist, but I started going to jail for it. And, um, <laughs> and I also experienced what Seabrook uh, means to me in, in hindsight. There is a kind of uh, stirring of a deep soul excitement your soul gets excited uh, that you're doing something that matters and you, everyone who is at your side and working with you uh, is, is suddenly becomes admirable and beloved and you're ready for anything. Uh, so I felt like you, you know, people talk about meeting your tribe, but there's a beautiful sense of um, generalized wild meta. <laughs> And, uh, and one night, at, at the first night at, at Seabrook, uh, they'd come in and they were in their tents, the protesters who were occupying, and I was trying to make pea soup over one little burner in the dirt. And then it got dark and I wandered through uh, where the, there were lights on in the little tents and there were the activists. And the next day there would be a fair and the next day there would be uh, a, a major demonstration with action at the state capitol. And I had the feeling then that I had leapfrogged out of the consumer society into, a, uh, into the future. Or maybe it was the past. Maybe I was with the ancestors. Maybe I was with the future ones. There was something incredible that was happening to a sense of being uh, with the most creative and uh, brave. Maybe I was with Frodo and Sam. And maybe it was just that kind of uh, readiness to uh, do everything in your power for the planet and its beings. So uh, then a little while later, uh, Jack invited me to come back to Boston where the Cousteau, Jacques-Yves Cousteau Society, was holding a uh, uh, symposium. Well, it was not just the issues of the oceans which are associated with uh, Cousteau, but there was also uh, almost every other uh, environmental uh, um, issue and there on the various floors of the Coliseum in Boston, there were all these booths and there were rooms where you could stop in and there were shows, there were panels and everything, you know, we talk about oil spills, the clubbing of baby seals, the loss of topsoil, the loss of plankton, that scared me to death because who still kept saying, you lose the plankton along with the trees and we'll run out of oxygen. And uh, so uh, suddenly there I got for the first time in my life, I knew all about these issues. Uh, 
I was then just completing my doctorate in Buddhist studies, um, Buddhist scriptures and systems theory. Uh, but it, I knew about them. I'd been working on them. But having them all at once, I fell, I fell through a hole into despair. And it was just at that time, too, that I learned that the government, the United States government, a report that it had commissioned about um, oil spills and, and tanking ta oil tankers and how to protect it. And the results of that study, paid for and commissioned by the government, was censored, locked up, not given to the public. And that contributed to this falling through a hole into despair. I thought, my God, if we're not allowed to know what we're facing, if those who are elected to serve, our, serve us block us from knowing, that's blocking the feedback. No system can survive if it's not allowed to get and hear the results of its own behavior. So that was part of this uh, dropping. And I, uh, it lasted a while. And maybe some of you here have experienced that in different ways and different doses. Uh, I didn't know if I would ever come out of it. Uh, it was so bitter to my mouth, uh, I didn't. I couldn't tell my family, as close as I am to my family. Uh, I didn't want to depress them about my spiritual, moral, <laughs> mental condition. What I remember one night is standing outside in our backyard and looking up at the stars. It was a clear night. And I was just looking. I said, please, somebody out there, please see us. I want you to see what's happening on planet Earth. And I realized it was not in order to save us. <laughs> I just want to know that you can see what happens to a planet where we haven't learned how to love each other. I thought that would make it much more bearable if we could just be a lesson to uh, the intelligences that are out there. And I'm sure there are a lot in our universe. So it was at that time then that I began to develop the uh, group work, the work that reconnects that uh, Sherry mentioned. And uh, I remember one of the first workshops I did, uh, it was at, um, at the Association of Humanistic Psychology, and I gave it, it was a day long, and I gave it the name Being Bodhisattvas. And I didn't think that everybody would know what a bodhisattva was, but I knew for me, and I would explain that, I would tell people about it, that the bodhisattva, and there's a hero in the Buddhist tradition that has a boundless heart and is not afraid to feel suffering with the uh, brother-sister beings. And that boundless heart uh, is one where you experience your unity uh, a, with all of creation, and that unity is so, uh, that interaction is so rich that uh, nothing can stop you. And that um, if there's any promise to life, it's through that, isn't it? So I began, we began practicing on how you could tell the truth about what you saw and felt uh, and knew was happening to your world. You had to create this kind of safe space because uh, the phrase that I was already becoming familiar with from psychiatrist Robert J. Lifton, psychic numbing, could see that that was true in spades of my own culture. And that, you know, the phrase, uh, denial is more than a river in Egypt. Uh, that there was people, there was, I don't want to, and I could see it. Don't tell me about it. I know we're in trouble, but if you ask me to... <laughs> You asked me to experience it. No, look, I've got a job to keep. I've got a family to support. Don't let me. I don't want to talk about it. So this was to break through that self-limiting 
behaviors on the part of ordinary people and that it's okay to feel pain for your world. There were articles then that appeared about this, and Sherry mentioned one. And about this time, uh, I got a phone call from someone I didn't know and would never meet, but he was a veteran, a Navy veteran, who had been exposed to uh, nuclear fallout and knew a lot about maybe he'd work with a nuclear submarine. Uh, I never met him, but he just said this. He said, if you want to look at if you want to help people look at what is hard to see, please look at what we're doing with uh, the radioactivity, with the splitting of the atom. And he had sent me to some material. This was uh, a book he wanted me to read by uh, scientist Walter Russell. And in that, he talked about the long, long periods of time into the future when our civilization would be over and done with and there would be succeeded by other ways of being human. But in those centuries ahead, there would be the reactors, the weapons plants, the uh, depots, uh, the enrichment plants for the uranium, and they would still be glowing cores of radioactivity on into the future. It was a nightmare vision. I mean, but I found that the, there was, you had to admit it if you looked at the science. So that motivated me to begin to look about. And I went down with, uh, I, I created a study action group. Because now, listen, let me tell you this. If you want to look at something that's painful, don't look at it alone. Get friends. <laughs> And uh, I selected for our study action group a nuclear engineer, a cosmologist, a kindergarten teacher, a dancer, an environmental lawyer. Uh, we were about a dozen. Potter, uh, cartographer. You want all kinds of minds to look at how do you handle uh, what will remain from even if you when you stop it, what will remain from our um, radioactive our chapter in creating radioactive substances? So uh, that unknown Navy veteran, I found myself thinking of him today as I thought of talking with you, and I had of what sometimes the littlest thing can just turn you, and so I went to with friends down to Los Alamos and to the Waste Isolation Pilot Project in Carlsbad, New Mexico, big first, one of the first repositories, and to scientists around the country uh, and that were dealing with uh, the storage and disposition uh, of, and even transmutation of radioactive waste. And, uh, both in government and industry, it was clear that uh, we didn't have an answer. It was clear that, uh, that not having an answer was not in any way uh, serving as a break on our production of the mountains of toxic uh, materials with, uh, that would be crippling, carrying, crippling and killing generations into uh, millions of years that the radioactive core of the nickel in the core, was, that would be radioactive for two million years. So, uh, of course, the plutonium, a quarter of a million years that you need for every nuclear warhead. So, uh, we thought, well, they don't know, but we're, that's not okay for us to proceed. Let's figure out ourselves. Let's think about what could be done with this. And that's, we began to uh, learn a lot. We, as a matter of fact, we operated in our study group on like other three levels, three S's. Study, which is we learned all about what radiation is and how it's generated. We, our nuclear engineer was put to a lot of use in that and our cosmologists in astrophysics. And then we did, uh, and 
laws and regulations about the containment, uh, how it was handled, and uh, the bureaucracy there. And then uh, that was that information. We knew we couldn't take it in straight. We <laughs> no, 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 no. We had to cry, and we had to drum, and we had to dance, and we had to meditate, and we had to make games. And uh, so you uh, absolutely, it's absolutely necessary when you're needing to stretch your mind and not go crazy. So, and then the third, so there was the study, what we called the spiritual, which was all kinds of work, a lot of it with the work that we connects and deep time work and hanging out in our imagination with the future beings and uh, seeing what they wanted, speaking for them, um, exercising our moral imagination. And then the third strategy, the third S, where we actually went out and gave presentations in community centers and in high schools and in churches and testimony in public hearings and scoping hearings of the Department of Energy and so forth. So uh, now throughout this time, uh, I had been re remaining in touch with a uh, group of de dear, dear friends who were Tibetan refugees that my family and I had met when we were living in India with the American Peace Corps. And at that time, which was in the middle of the it was exactly, actually, 50 years ago now that I met them, Lozar, uh, 1965. That changed my life because that's when I saw what uh, the Buddha Dharma could, sh how it could shine through uh, people. And uh, uh, so we became very dear friends. And I helped them to, with other Peace Corps volunteers, to settle in Congra Valley, a little to the north of Dharamsala, where His Holiness the Dalai Lama lives. And that this tradition was what we call Red Hat tradition, Kargyu, like uh, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. As a matter of fact, they were about the same age and, uh, as he and old friends. So uh, during this time, uh, I went back uh, Periodically, I'd be seeing them because I was on field work in, in Asia or on a... And so sometimes they came to the States, so us. So I want to talk to you, uh, tell you two stories about encounters, times with them, and right in that time as the uh, guardianship notion was developing and the, as well as the work, uh, the work that reconnects. My closest friend in this community, and the name of the community is Tashi Jong, which means Blessed Valley. Uh, this community had about 100 monks and about 300 lay people and a, a number of uh, tulkus, reincarnated lamas. Among them were my, so my best friend, Dharma brother, Dugu Chugel Rinpoche. And when I was visiting with my family, uh, it was when I was doing field work in Asia and they'd come over to see me. Uh, Dugu Chugel Rinpoche sat down with me alone and he said, there's something I want you to know. And he proceeded to tell me a prophecy that he had received an oral prophecy that relating to the Kala Chakra Tantra. And uh, so many of you in this room have heard it because it took, it had such an impact on me that it, well, it gave me my marching orders and it helped me with the work that reconnects. And so uh, I've been asked to share it with you tonight because it's okay to hear it more than once. <laughs> Actually, there are a lot of things you need to hear a lot. <laughs> and, and I want you to uh, hear this knowing that it's about you. And as you hear it, you will uh, understand that the hero figure in it, known as the, called the Shambhala warrior, is a metaphor for the Bodhisattva. These are his words as I heard them. There comes a time 
when all life on earth is in danger. In this time, powerful barbarian forces have arisen. And although they waste their wealth in preparations to annihilate each other, they have much in common. And among the things they have in common, these barbarian forces are weapons of unfathomable devastation and death and technologies that lay waste to the world. And it is just at this time when the future of all beings hangs by the frailest of threads that the kingdom of Shambhala emerges. Now you can't go there because it's not a place. It exists in the hearts and minds of the Shambhala warriors. And actually you can't tell a Shambhala warrior by looking at her or him because there are no uniforms, no insignias, no banners to show what side they're on, no barricades on which to threaten the enemy or behind which to regroup, not even any home turf but only the terrain of the barbarian powers to negotiate and move across. And he said, Joanna, now is the time when great courage is required of the Shambhala warriors, moral courage and physical courage, because they're going to go into the heart of the barbarian power to dismantle the weapons, weapons in every sense of the word. They're going to go to where the armaments are fabricated and deployed. They're going to go into the corridors of power where the decisions are made and dismantle the weapons. And he said, Joanna, mark this. The Shambhala warriors know that these weapons can be dismantled. Why? Because they are manomaya, mind made. They are made by the human mind. They can be unmade by the human mind. Because the dangers that face us now do not come from some satanic deity or some evil extraterrestrial force or even from some inalterable predestined fate. They arise out of our lives, out of our habits, out of our choices, out of our relationships. They are made by the human mind. They can be unmade by the human mind. Then he said, now is the time the Shambhala warriors go into training. Well, you can imagine, I said, how do they train? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, they train in the use of two weapons. That's actually the term he used. What are they, I asked. And he held up his hands the way the lamas hold the ritual objects in the great lama dances of his people. And he said, one is compassion, and the other is insight into the radical interdependence of all phenomena. <laughs> and you need both. One is not enough. You need the compassion because that provides the fuel, the motive force, for you to go out where you need to go to do what you need to do. And what it boils down to is to not be afraid of the suffering of your world or of yourself. And if you're not afraid of that, then nothing can stop you. But that's so hot, that weapon, that can burn you out. So you need the other cooler. And with that, you know how interconnected, we're so interconnected and all through the web of life that this is not, you none you realize this is not a battle between good guys and bad guys. And we're so, inter because, but that the good and evil, the line between good and evil runs through the landscape of every human art and that we're so interwoven and woven in the fabric of existence that even the smallest act with clear intention has repercussions through the web of life that you can't begin to just barely begin to discern, let alone measure. But that's kind of cool that line of, and abstract, isn't it? He said, so you need the heat of the compassion. You need them both. 
And as he said that, I remembered uh, seeing the moving gestures, mudras, uh, in the puja hall of the monks chanting. And I recalled that likely as not, they're dancing the interplay between karuna and prajna, between compassion and wisdom. Well, as I said, I felt I got my marching orders. Now, my family was with me at the time, and it was getting late in the afternoon, and I left Chugal Rinpoche and ran down the hill to where my family was staying at the edge of the community of Tashi Chong, and I burst in, and they were there, and I said, you won't believe what I just heard from Chugal Rinpoche. <laughs> and I proceeded to tell them, and that was my first telling of this prophecy. So they listened. And my son, Jack, Jack again, listened and he said, but mom, didn't you just tell you how it's going to turn out? <laughs> and I laughed and I said, honey, if Dukhu Chukya Rinpoche had told me how it was going to turn out, I wouldn't have believed any of it. And don't you believe people who tell you what is how it's going to turn out this story of life on this planet. What is going to happen from our actions and our choices? Because it is that not knowing, it is that razor edge of radical uncertainty that wakes us up, brings us fully into the present, fully there, where we want to be not half asleep, not wishing and debating it were some other way, but being radically present right there. That's where the creativity is. That's where the courage is. So you can imagine that that was important for me and in and, and the work and in almost everything I did and then the uh, groping and dealing with the poison fire and trying to understand it and trying to see what could happen and not saying I'm not, can't just leave it to somebody else to think about, I tried that. Well, uh, nine years later, I'd already uh, been during that time with Dukhu Chuyo Rinpoche and my two members of my family with him in Tibet. But this I was back at Tashi Chong. And uh, I was with a group of students, a traveling seminar. We were there for a month or two. Uh, and when I arrived and was greeted by my dear friend, uh, this, uh, he's an artist, you know. He's a painter, and that's part of the uh, what he brings to bear to questions like this. He has a quality of uh, sparky imagination that the artist uh, ways of seeing, intuitive ways of seeing what might be possible, what might be there, what's escaping our notice. So at any rate, when I got there, he said, Joanna, in your... Um, letters, you've been talking about nuclear something, and you've been talking about guardianship. Uh, I'd like to understand that. So I began to explain, and he cut me off, and he said, no, I would like you to explain it to the monastery. What? Me tell something to the monastery, to all those monks? And there were yogis, too, that were the most venerated of all to have come out of Tibet. And he said, yes. And I said, oh, oh, oh okay. He said, he said, now tonight, how's tonight? Uh-huh. I said, well, I would like a, I said, they know about atoms, don't they? And he said, you better explain. Okay. I said, I want a blackboard. And so that night, we gathered in the big uh, teaching hall at the Kampagar Monastery there at Tashijong. And it was an evening I will never forget. 
It was as if I'd somehow gone to a planet, another planet of very wise beings, and was telling them what had happened on Earth. So I said to them, you know, uh, in, in this century, because this was 1989 now, I said, in this century, the Western scientists uh, have uh, determined, come to believe, that the whole universe is made up of uh, very tiny little centers of energy of great potency. And, uh, and they're made of particles. And uh, so, uh, and each element uh, has a different number of these. And, uh, and there are nucleus where they're, the particles, protons and, and, and neutrons are held together by the strongest binding power in the universe. And then they're surrounded in orbit by particles, electrons of the same number as the protons. But it was this, this nucleus, uh, when you get to the heaviest element of all, it's got 92 of these protons and equal number of neutrons, and, and it's unwieldy, it's heavy. And of course, you've got all these electrons going around. So Western scientists have found that got to experimenting that they could bombard the nucleus to knock off a uh, particle and release the strongest binding power in the universe. And they did it and they tried it and it worked. And then they took the strongest binding power in the universe and they put it in a container and they dropped it on two great cities. And they burned up in the first 160,000 people all at once, and then they burned up uh, 70,000 people all at once three days later. And then I wrote down the number of the uh, people that were burned all at once. And I told the names, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, well, the monks were just stirring when they saw this number, when they heard that, and they were just, oh, what was. So I thought, wait till I, wait till I tell them about the time. That'll roll, that'll knock them off there. So I said, and then we found how long this, radio, this radiation lasts. First time told, we then took this power and we decided to use it to boil water and to make electricity from that. But at every stage of making this, there are everything that it touches, the trucks, the booties, the gloves, the buildings, the shovels, the, become poisoned. They're poisonous and contaminated and contaminating. And the contamination lasts and then I began writing out. I was doing this in the environmental uh, leadership course yesterday, writing out the, with the, all the zeros of the uh, millions of years that this uh, poison will last. And I expected that that would cause a similar uh, impression on my uh, audience of in their maroon robes sitting there uh, and the, huh, it's just time. <laughs> it's just time. And you just do it longer. <laughs> just, and uh, so I proceeded to uh, tell them that uh, our study group had decided that the only way that we could handle this is to pay attention to this, this poison fire. That our government was doing everything to an industry to hide it, to put it out of sight and out of mind. And that we uh, didn't know, you know, just like up here at Rocky Flats, just the signs that that was a bomb factory, that that was radiation. So just take down the signs as if it never happened. Put it away, just wipe the slate clean as if it's just some kind of uh, deliberately induced amnesia. 
uh, which unfortunately doesn't make the poison fire go away. So I said we had learned that we could, what we could do with this, it seemed to me, is that we could remember it and that we would build customs and rituals where everybody, and, and education, and we'd teach it in our schools, we would all learn that we had made this, and when we stopped making it, we would keep remembering because we have to take care of this for so many years into the future, from generation to generation. And we know that's hard because to remember that is the last thing we want to pay attention to. We'll spend billions of dollars to make the most expensive deep uh, repositories. The one I visited in the Waste Isolation Pilot Project, they said with pride it's going to last 100 years. <laughs> but it has lasted only a fraction of that. It's closed now because of accidents, partly relating to the encroachment of the instability of the earth from fracking nearby. In any case, I said, we need to remember, but we can do this. And I know we can do this because of what I've learned from you. You, my brothers at, at Tashi Chong, you, my brothers at the uh, Kampagar Monastery, you and the lay people, my brothers and sisters, the whole community, you remember the teachings and uh, stories of Pema Sambhava. You remember the scriptures about the Lord Buddha. You've been remembering them for thousands of years. And we can do that too. We'll simply remember the poison fire. Maybe I'll tell you that, that uh, just at the end of that evening, uh, Dukku Chirgyal Rinpoche, who had been interpreting for me, uh, he had called the chief yogi, the highest Tokhtan Anjim uh, of the community who had been in retreat to come down and listen to this. And so then he turned to uh, Tokhtan Anjim, who had been sitting there in utter serenity, <laughs> listening to all this in his usual composure. And he asked, uh, him if he had any response to what uh, our friend Joanna had been sharing. And his response, uh, as it was interpreted to me, interpreted to me, because I don't speak to Ben, was, please do not get discouraged or tired because this is the work of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Well, try hearing that about something. It doesn't matter then how long it takes. It doesn't matter then how much you stumble along the way. It doesn't matter if you get discouraged. <laughs> it's the work of the world. Then you just feel blessed, don't you? <laughs> so uh, the second part of my talk uh, is then uh, relates to the title. I've given you how I'm running up, running up to this notion of uh, guardianship. That instead of putting the poison fire away where no one will see it, where the future generations won't know where it, what it is or whence is coming the illness that eats their bones and mutates their uh, cells, uh, you simply put your mind on it. That's all that is necessary because then you can monitor it. Then when the containment gets embrittled, cracks, you repair it. Spray some cement on it. But you just, the one thing that our government and industry don't want to do is look at it. And this is the one thing that's necessary. Well, that's not, it should not be a big surprise for us because that's in our own personal lives. We know about what happens to us when there's a part of our experience or our being in our landscape that we won't look at, that we hide. It kind of poisons everything else, doesn't it? So 
So, this is part number two, Roman numerals, which is very short. The challenge of the poison fire. The challenge of the poison fire then is to see it. The challenge of the poison fire then is to accept the reality of its existence. The challenge of the poison fire is to acknowledge our relationship to it. And if we can do that, and when we can do that, then we become able to hear what the poison fire is saying, and particularly what the plutonium, what we're facing up here, right here at Rocky Flats from making 70,000 plutonium pits for every warhead in the U.S. arsenal, we could hear what it's saying, what the plutonium is saying as it's carted off some, a lot of it to uh, Idaho, which is, makes Christopher Hormel's relationship to it very interesting because he also is from Idaho. He's working at both ends of this remarkable. But all kinds of sleights of hand uh, and raise the, uh, lower the standards of radiation and raise it, whatever, to make it so that we don't know it's there. So the challenge of the poison fire is to hear the plutonium talking to us, saying, you made me, look at me, see me, don't abandon me. When you abandon me, there's no control. I can go through the water and the air and the soil and I will continue to wreck life. You made me. Look at me. If you look at me, I will teach you. I will teach you courage. I will teach you faithfulness. So now, let's look at what the teachings are that the poison fire can give us. So first to the teachings, it's also a gift that we open our eyes, that we see things as they are, that we uh, not only experience the heartbreak. My God, did we really do this? Have we done this as a culture? Well, you know, it's easier to admit it than to f run from it all the time, and we're a culture in flight. <clears throat> and when your heart breaks, you know, that's not the worst thing. They say the heart that breaks open can hold the whole universe. So you learn to look at the poison fire and you look, need to look at what our people can do. And the reward of that is uh, a kind of liberation a liberation from having to dodge what's true. It gets so tiresome. You're so ready for any distraction. We could look at our culture and see in some ways our war making and our distractedness has come kind of running away from ourselves. If you could just stop, here I am. I look at who we are in this time and what we've done. And the poison fire can help us with that. A second teaching of the poison fire is to not try to face it alone and not try to respond to it alone. And in the class we had this weekend with Sherry and the environmental leadership, there was so much that we could 
uh, face in a way that uh, you could feel a wave of kind of relief at, at being able to look at this news together. No person by herself or himself could have made this. We need each other. We need each other not only to uh, pay attention to it, but just to, to, to see it, yes. Another teaching of the poison fire is that it helps us know our true age. It helps us, as I say, therefore, if we know our true age, to act our age. And by that, I mean uh, not my venerable age, of which I'm pretty proud now at 85 years old, but <laughs> uh, the, uh, the age of every atom and every molecule in your hand, it goes back, back to the formation of the galaxies. You are that old. Or if you want to be modest and play younger, then just take the age of this earth. That means you're four billion years old. <laughs> and what's great about that is that you can sort of um, realize that you're not taking a step or talking to your congressperson or talking back to uh, anyway, but that you are uh, embarking on an action not out of some little whim of personal nobility, virtue, but out of your authority, of your four billion years of being in this planet. Because you are representing that, you're acting on behalf of a life much larger than your little span from birth to death in this lifetime. Working with the poison fire has, as we were playing around in class to this weekend and all certain of my, expands the temporal context of our lives. And you know that uh, things have, uh, that you need to work with, that the actions, they're not gonna be work out necessarily before you die. We've been, uh, causing mischief for many generations now. And so when we begin to act for the sake of Earth, we can't count on having that succeed before we kick the bucket. <laughs> so what's great about that, I found, is that means that it frees you from your dependence on seeing the results of your actions. You know, uh, I've been hearing so much of my life wise people saying, you know, I don't, uh, 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 be, oh, I, uh, you don't need to see the results of your actions. Be aloof from that. Don't be attached, that's it. Don't be attached to the results of your actions. And it's totally beyond me because I am attached. I'm attached to there being life. I'm attached to there being clean water and clean air. But what I don't have to do is see the results in my own lifetime. So realizing that in a wider time frame is sort of like a poor man's enlightenment, you know? <laughs> oh. Yeah, I don't have to see that. And so I, it's, it's very liberating. And then what this opens us to, uh, which has been very, it was in, in our fire group, that was our study action group that lasted for four or five years. It testified at hearings. It brought out a tabloid newspaper three years. It was, uh, it shaped me and shaped our guardianship concept in the most wonderful way. This was late 80s, early 90s. And that the, uh, so much of it that was brought was expanding our experience of time and experiencing that uh, the uh, ancestors are in us. Their blood flows through our veins. Their tricks of mind or thought, the color of their jaw, the texture of their your hair, the color of their eyes, they're in you. 
And many of those ancestors back in the centuries, you know how they worked on monuments of learning and art, temples, cathedrals, irrigation systems that they wouldn't see completed in their lifetime. But they were part of something, uh, a big effort. How good that feels to know that we're engaged on something that could take hundreds of years or a thousand years. Whew. You don't have to pretend you can do it all in the little family. You just allot it to you and open your heart minds to a vaster movement of the human spirit and creativity. And, even, and just as much to feel the presence of the uh, future ones. One of my teachers, Sister Rosalie Bertel, a radiologist who did absolute groundbreaking work in understanding uh, ionizing radiation from weapons and energy production and a uh, expert witness at many a panel and many a trial of a nuclear activist. And she said this, she said, every being who will ever live on earth is here now. What? Where? In your ovaries and in your gonads and in your DNA. And the decisions you're making now, often under great pressure of expedience, profit, or bureaucracy, have everything to do with whether they will have a chance to be born sound of mind and spirit. I have derived so much benefit of feeling the future ones, that beautiful, uh, and playing with it in our workshops almost all of them now, that I have found that this is the kind of gift that facing uh, bad news, that facing the poison fire can give you. It can give you the proximity, the company of your ancestors and your future, your descendants, the progenies, all those who come after doesn't have to be in your genetic line. And so that they are, uh, I have the sense, you know, there's this chain of the generations now, and, and the one we're in, our link in the human journey, if you can see, is, is kind of frayed. We've done so much that's colossally destructive to uh, both to the seeds and the cells, the inner microscopic level of existence as well as to the climate, as well as to the oceans and forests, the soil, the rivers. There's so much healing to be done. And I get the feeling sometimes that the ancestors and the future beings right there wanting to help. But they only have our hands. They only have our voices. But when we're ready to let them, oh boy, they show up. They have a sense of humor, too. <laughs> there are times when I thought, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. I did not buy into this. I'm not a nuclear rear. I didn't go to understand. I'm blah, 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 blah. And then I could hear, they usually over on the left shoulder, the future ones. And they said, just stop being such a drama queen. You're the one who's alive now. So go to. We'll help you, but you're the one who's alive. We're the ones who are alive now. So uh, you're kind of, what's another teaching of the poison fire? 
uh, it helps us to retrieve our mind to, by paying attention. In an era when uh, our minds are so fractured and fragmented and distracted all to pieces. And it helps us, the poison fire challenges us to retrieve the capacity of our mind. Because over the last generation or more, but particularly with electronic technology, we have been externalizing our knowledge. We haven't needed to remember things because we can look them up on our smartphone or our, in the internet at the touch of a button. There are scientists and scholars wondering now how we are going to face up to the challenges we'll face when with the changes to, that are coming with attendant on serious climate change. We have electrical outages. That means we can't reach our externalized knowledge. We once, and when you look at the, our ancestors here, I use ancestor in terms of everybody who's gone before us, our brothers and sisters of the First Nations, their elders, and a lot of them still have this extraordinary capacity that is there and shaped by the oral tradition, the oral mind. They know how to remember. We must learn again how to remember. Because we're not, we're going to need that when the lights go out. Not the starlight, not the moonlight, not the firelight, but the electrons pulsing from the power plants. There's a very, Richard Heinberg, one of my teachers, uh, devotes considerable thought to that in a book of his is coming out next month. Look for it, Richard Heinberg, Afterburn. <laughs> what? This is what we're facing. As he says, after the great burning. So uh, we need to also, for the sake of the future ones, that's what guardianship means. It means to learn the stories and the physics. We can encode them into dances. We can encode them into songs, whatever. But we have to learn to carry this in our minds because that has to be passed on for generations and generations, and we can. Our ancestors and those native people alive now, they show us this can be done. We can practice harvesting the stories. They're wonderful stories about the people who are standing up to the uh, nuclear, uh, this releasing the strongest binding power in the universe and where it's taken us and so many brave people and so many things have been done uh, and right here. So on your, um, oh, where is it? On your chair is this wonderful uh, brochure, this booklet. Three cheers for Rocky Flats Nuclear Guardianship. Hey! All right. By the faithfulness and diligence and vision of uh, a small band of brave, faithful beings. Uh, Leroy Moore, Judith Moling, Kathleen Sullivan, Christopher Hormel, and those that have joined them. Uh, a uh, guardianship vision has, over the last mm, years, uh, come here to Rocky Flats where it's needed. 
I remember Leroy and I were thinking about, uh, and it was in 1982, I was visiting and he took me up on the side of the hills there looking down at Rocky Flats. I wanted to see it. I wanted to see where the plutonium pits were made. It was still in operation. And he says that I had one question to ask him when it was done, and that was, Leroy, do you think we'll make it? But that was 32 years ago. The plant is closed. A wonderful book about it has been read, written by Kristen Iverson, Full Body Burden. She grew up here and worked in the plant for a while. People are devoting themselves to seeing how the plutonium that is there, and in this will tell you, that I've got to stop talking now. I've been talking for an hour. I know, I'm about to close. <laughs> but uh, there's a, a marvelous, uh, uh, exquisitely, uh, economical statement about what you need to know about Rocky Flats, what you need to know about plutonium and the pits. Take a look, and, and I should also want to thank Robert Del Tredici, whose pictures, and he also was deeply touched in his life by Chogim Trungpa Rinpoche and has an exhibit now, does he not? Yeah, of photographs. The Rocky Flats timeline, and then you come to the realization that it has been turned over from the Department of Energy to Fish and Wildlife for Recreation Area after a totally sloppy, inadequate cleanup. That's criminal. So we're going to do something about it. And we are doing something about it. It's not going to go on to just be a place where the... Uh, unsuspecting and the young can be uh, and people in search of a, a McMansion in uh, Candelas uh, can buy a house uh, in, in, uh, in an area where that is contaminated, an area where the wind blows still strong and in where an area where the burrowing animals can bring up the plutonium from far, from far deeper than what the DOE says they cleaned. So if you want an adventure, friends, if you want to have a good time in this life, if you want to figure out how big your spirit can grow, if you want to find new doses of courage and understanding of time, uh, <laughs> and, so I would like to just ask Judith Moling to step up here for a moment to tell us about the uh, meeting this coming. And what a bountiful heart we've just heard from. Thank you. Oh, do we have that one? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Joanna. And thank you. <laughs> and and I, when we came here to pass these out on the chairs, I promised the manager of this area that it, that it would be okay and that you wouldn't leave them behind because she was worried about that. And I said, I will pick up anything that's left behind. So take these gorgeous things home, share them, give them to your neighbors. And, and, and read them. And, in, and inside is a flyer talking about how you can engage with the, the, the brave little band of nuclear guardians here in this area. And you can start this coming Thursday night at 7 o'clock in this room. So here? Right here. Well. <laughs> Thursday night. <laughs> 7 p.m. This Thursday? This Thursday. <laughs> what time? <laughs> 7 o'clock. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Joanna. <laughs> you know.
know you're not going to get out of here without me closing with some poetry. And I have uh, uh, three uh, poems uh, for you that feel uh, very relevant, uh, that, that strengthen me uh, in uh, learning from and receiving the gifts of the poison fire. One is the sense of expansion of identity when you work on behalf of planet Earth, on behalf of the future ones. I live my life in widening circles. Now, the first line, I'll say it in German the way they, this was written over 100 years ago when the poet Rainer Maria Rilke was 23 years old. Ich lebe mein Leben in wachsenden Ringen, die sich über die Dinge ziehen. I live my life in widening circles that reach out across the world. I may not complete this last one, but I give myself to it. I circle around God, that primordial tower I've been circling for thousands of years. And I still don't know. Am I a falcon, a storm, or a great song? Then there's a poem about uh, what you're ready to face from the same collection, the Book of Hours. God speaks to each of us as he makes us, then walks with us silently out of the night, and these are the words we dimly hear. Now it's God talking. You cast out beyond your recall, go to the limits of your longing, embody me. Flare up like flame and make big shadows I can work in. Let everything happen to you. Beauty and terror. Just keep going. No feeling is final. Don't let yourself lose me. Nearby is the country they call life. You'll know it by its seriousness. Give me your hand. And now, uh, third poem, very short, part from uh, the sonnets to Orpheus, and just portions of that. But just... Uh, He's thinking about the ancestors and they feel so close to him, even the very first ones. And he writes, oh, the pleasure of it, always emerging new from the loosened clay. Those who dared to come first had hardly any help. Nevertheless, cities arose on sun-favored coasts and pitchers filled with water and oil. We are one generation through thousands of years. Mothers and fathers shaped by children to come, who in their turn will overtake them. We are endlessly offered into life. All time is ours. I want to read those last four lines again, and then that will be the end of We are one generation through thousands of years, mothers and fathers shaped by the children to come, who in their turn will overtake them. We are one, we are endlessly offered into life. All time is ours.